Hello, welcome back. It's the fourth Applied Active Inference Symposium, Day 2, Part 2, on November 14th, 2024. We're kicking off this session in the darkness of the pre-dawn on the West Coast, appropriately with Mehran Hussain Zadeh Bazagarani, ML Dawn, Brain in the Dark, Design Principles for the Neuromimetic inference under the free energy principle. So thank you, Maron, for joining. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the design principles for neuromimetic inference under the free energy principle, namely the methods that are inspired by the brain um, in order to model human perception. Um, uh, just um, want to preface this by saying that this is a collaboration with my colleague Simon Orbas from Maynooth University and Professor Friston from UCL. And this work has recently been accepted at the NeuroAI workshop at NeurIPS 2024. Mm -hmm. So let's just get started. The content is going to be as follows. We're going to be talking about first the motivation behind this work, why we got started with this idea anyway to, to introduce the design principles, particularly for these models. And then I'm going to do a quick refresher on the math side, just so we all get comfortable with the, you know, the upcoming derivations that I'm going to be uh, expanding on, which covers the math behind free en the free energy principle, particularly uh, variational free energy. Then I'll do a brief discussion on what free energy principle is. I presume everybody knows by now because like, we've, we've had so many talks uh, since uh, in the beginning of the symposium, but I'm going to do a quick run at that. Then we'll be talking about the Bayesian brain hypothesis that furnishes the foundation for the idea of modeling human perception as a kind of inference, namely Bayesian inference. Next, we dive into the juxtaposition between the generative model and a generative process. What do we mean by each one of them? Knowing the distinction is crucial for understanding the free energy principle because FEP lies on this um, notion that there is a boundary that separates an entity from uh, the environment and separating uh, basically my internal state from the ex external state beyond my Markov blanket. Next, we'll talk about variational free energy and how it's driven, uh, how it's derived basically. And then we jump into the design principles in terms of the experiments, that the things that you need to consider, the things that you need to define and how you should go about doing that in order to model human perception as a kind of online inference problem. We'll go through some final thoughts, some lessons learned, and then I'll introduce some of the resources for those of you who are interested in uh, you know, pursuing free energy principle more seriously and delving into the theory and the practical side of it. And then we're going to wrap it up with uh, a demonstration um, using the GitHub repository that, uh, that is publicly available, at, by, um, by, by the way. So... The motivation is this. So you said deep learning has revolutionized artificial intelligence um, because it has automated the process of feature extraction from raw data. However, it actually f faces a lot of problems. For example, lack of out of distribution uh, generalizability, catastrophic forgetting, and poor interpretability. It is known as a black box basically. And the catastrophic forgetting is basically when the new knowledge overwrites the previous knowledge, the weights are getting overwritten. So while the network learns the concept of a cat, it might momentarily forget the concept of a dog because the paths are shared between different concepts that are to be learned. You see, in contrast to deep learning, Biological neural networks in your brain and in my brain, they do not suffer from these issues. And this inspires the AI researchers to actually explore this interesting and intriguing area called the neuromimetic deep learning. That is uh, all about replicating the brain mechanisms, namely the neuronal message passing and belief updating within the AI models, purely inspired by our best knowledge about how the brain works. Um, a foundational theory for this approach is the free energy principle, 
um, FEP, which unfortunately, despite its potential, is often considered too complex to understand and to implement in AI simply because uh, one would need a myriad of disciplines um, under their belt, knowledge about disciplines under their belt, to be able to understand the free energy principle. Namely, you need to know things, for example, about dynamical systems, random processes, you need to know about Bayesian me mechanics, some neuroscience, some maybe computational neuroscience, and so on and so forth. So as a, as a result, it's not it's an intimidating topic, let's say, for anybody who wants to just get started with it. So we seek to demystify FEP and basically provide a comprehensive framework for designing neuromimetic models within, well, where we are actually trying to mimic human-like perception capabilities. Um, so <clears throat> here we present a roadmap for implementing these models. And by the way, a PyTorch code repository for applying FEP in a predictive coding network is going to be introduced here. <clears throat> the link is here that that's a code. It's publicly available. And um, also, as I said, uh, the paper will soon be available um, by the Neuro AI workshop. Um, and so hopefully you guys will have a chance to take a look at that as well. Now, let's get started with the ref refresher of the math. So first and foremost, the idea of a PDF. So it it's an acronym for a probability density function, which is a function that describes the likelihood of a continuous random variable taking on a particular value. It has two conditions. It has to be positive. So for a given parameter theta zero, for example, the mean of a Gaussian, let's say, uh, for any input x, it's always positive. And second, we have this normalizer uh, sort of condition that if you integrate a PDF across the support space of, of the input, namely all possible values of x, you will inevitably must receive get to the actual value of 1. What this means is the probability of x, the input, getting any value in, a, in any range within its support is always 1, which means that x will always fall in, in a range in, that, in its own accepted range of values. So that's 100%. So you need these two if you want to have a PDF. Next is the idea of an expectation. I just want to remind you that the reason I'm going through this math is because later on when I introduce the steps of deriving um, you know, a variational free energy, these concepts are absolutely crucial. So hopefully um, I'm not going too fast, but um, yeah, just bear that in mind that these are very important. And for those of you who are you know, math savvy, and these are two basics, my apologies. Now, the idea of expectation is actually the weighted average of all the possible values that the variable can assume, weighted by their probability. So you have the, in the first line um, the expected value of x over the probability distribution, the PDF px. So you, as you notice, we're integrating all possible values of x multiplied by or weighted by their corresponding probability. And it's important to note that you don't, you're not limited to, you know, calculating the, um, the expected value with respect to a variable, but you can also do this exactly the same thing with a function. So the expected value of function is again, the same thing, but you are summing up a weight. You're basically calculating a weighted average of a function where the weights are the probability of the input to that function, which is x. Now, some key prob probability components here. Now, we have this idea of a joint probability. Um, so a joint distribution between two variables, x, x and y, you can divide it up uh, b between like, like some conditional term, which is the probability of x given y multiplied by the probability of y in the first place. Or you can go the other way around, the probability of y given x times the probability of x. You notice that if x and y are independent, this conditional term reduces to probability of x. Or this conditional term will reduce to probability of y. So either way, on both sides, you're going to have the probability of x given y um, if x and y are indeed independent. Next, if you want to move from a joint distribution to 
a marginalized distribution where you're actually marginalizing one of the variables out, this is how you can do it. So in this case, if you integrate P of X, Y across all possible, possible values of X, in other words, like if you literally break this down and, you know, uh, basically write it down in, in its you know um, constituent terms if you do this integration you're inevitably what basically what you're doing is you're getting rid of x and then you end up with a term with a probability distribution that is only a function of um y and that's what you call a marginalized probability distribution or pdf again this is key where will this come in handy? It's going to come in handy when, when I'm going to be talking about the Bayesian brain hypothesis and Bayes' rule and so on and so forth. So keep these two equations in mind, please. Now, some properties of logarithms. So this is basically just the definition of a log. So log of A with base B equals C. The definition says that it just means A equals B to the power C. Right. So for example, the log of 8 base 2 equals 3, because 2 to the power 3 is 8. So the log of a multiplication is the sum of the logs of individual terms. The log of a division is the subtraction of individual log terms, so the log of the nominator minus the log of the denominator. Um, the log of a fraction is literally minus the log of the swapped fraction. If you literally swap B and A together, from, like, you, know, you end up with just a negative of the, lo of the new log term. Um, the power law, the log of b to the power c, so basically c drops down as a coefficient, so you end up with this term, c times log of b with base a. Log of a with base a, if the value and the base are both the same, you end up with value 1, and by extension, if you have this term, c drops down as a coefficient, and this term equals 1, so you end up with c. Log of 1 with any base is always equal to 0. Why? Because a, whatever it is, to the power 0 is 1. And last but not least, this one is again very important. Ln of a is basically just a logarithm, a logarithm with you know where the base is natural number e, or it's called the natural log, and e is basically the Euler num Euler's number. So you got log of a with base e. It's called just the natural log. So when in, in Python, when you say numpy dot log, it's basically the natural log. Now, the free energy principle, it is a theoretical framework in neuroscience. It's been developed by Carl Friston. So basically, things that persist over time, especially living systems, look as if they are minimizing a certain quantity. It's called free energy. It is as if they're uh, sort of maintaining this boundary that is called a Markov blanket to persist in the face of random fluctuations in the, uh, in the environment. Um, and... This really connects well with the Bayesian brain hypothesis, as you will see shortly. So the brain, from the perspective of Bayesian brain hypothesis, it's actually in the game of inferring the hidden causes behind its sensations. So namely, if you have, if you, let's say, use Y to denote the sensations and X as the hidden state, and then this inference basically means that given my observation y, I want to um, estimate the probability distribution over x, right? It's basically called a posterior probability, which means that after having seen an observation, um, what is causing in the world beyond my Markov blanket this particular sensation or observation? Inevitably, this requires having a generative model, GM, of the world. And this actually con connects really well with Helmholtz's um, concept of unconscious inference. And it is defined like that perception is kind of unconscious inference, which means that we are in the game of, you know, inferring the hidden cause behind our, our, our sensations. For example, right now you're looking at the monitor and the photons, but the light is hitting the your sensory epithelia on your eyes those excitations those those hits those are your sensation and when you realize that i'm i'm watching this presentation at at, at active inference institute 
Um, and this guy is talking, his name is Mehran. This is the, the slide of a, of a face. Helmholtz picture is here. These are the inferences that your brain is making given that particular sensation that is hitting uh, the, the neurons on the surface of your eyes, right? So it's estimating this probability distribution about what's happening beyond your Markov blanket. Now, let's talk about the idea of a generative model versus a generative process. This is actually very, very important. On the right-hand side, you see this, idea, uh, this generative model as a box, and it has some internal states. Let's call them hidden states. This represents the neuronal activities in your brain, um, the excitabilities um, uh, of different, you know, the, the voltage, the voltage level, let's say, of your neurons that are keep changing all the time. They fluctuate all the time, and these guys are basically holding information about what's happening beyond your Markov blanket. Right? Remember, what's happening beyond your Markov blanket is out of your reach. You have absolutely no way of observing exactly what's happening right and here we have the generative process where x star denotes the actual things that are happening in the world which are completely out of reach to you now if you imagine here you have the face of a person let's say steve job is standing in front of me but this is no like i'm, I'm not going to see the truth what I'm going to see is some sort of a, um, a map, some sort of a noisy transformation of the truth, X star, right? Let's call it Y. This is what I'm going to be experiencing. This is what's going to hit and uh, induce excitation at my sensory epithelia on my eyes. And then if you want to look at, like, um, basically dig deeper into the idea of perception as um, unconscious inference, the, ga the game is this. Your brain, the generative model in your brain, predicts a sensation. Like, I'm expecting this sensation to be felt or received at my sensory epithelia, on my Markov blanket. And then the actual sensation, Y, is received. So the difference between the actual sensation and my prediction is called the prediction error. So using that prediction error, I will update my generative model about the world. Namely, I will update my belief about what's happening in the world. So this is where my internal states will change to reflect a better image of the unknown world beyond my Markov blanket. Or the parameters of my generative model are going to change um, to, again, do a better estimate of what's happening in the world so that I will have a better prediction about the sensations that that world is going to cause, right? So generative process, again, is not directly observable. And the internal uh, states X, this is very important, carry information about the invisible external states X star beyond my Markov blanket. This is where this connects to the, idea, uh, the, the discipline of information theory. This is a very important link, by the way. So the generative model, what do we mean by that, mathematically speaking? Now, in a dynamical world, a generative model has a belief about the dynamics of the world. What it means is, how fast is the world changing, for example, or how is it changing? Now, if the world is at a given state X, right? What does its dynamics look like? For example, its velocity or acceleration or even higher temporal derivatives are like jerk. Basically, all sorts of rates of changes, the rates of change about the world. That's what, what I mean by dynamics. So in a generative model, your generative model will have an understanding, has to have a belief about how the world is changing beyond a smart cop blanket. So in other words, if I'm in the game of estimating the dynamics of the world, it means I'm chasing a moving target. What it means is, at any given time, when I want to infer what's happening in the world, by the time I've made that inference, the world has already moved. So that basically makes inference uh, a tricky task, especially if I'm in a, in a you know, highly dynamical world. It makes it more challenging. The second thing that in a generative model we should have is the generative model has a belief about how the world causes its sensations. Namely, if the world is at any given state, but by my estimation, beyond my Markov blanket, what is the most likely sensation why that I will be experiencing, right? 
So these two are the key components of a generative model. So the, like mathematically, this is how you show it. X dot is literally the velocity of uh, the world, how fast it's changing. Mathematically, it's just dx over dt. And then you have some function of the states, x, and causes new and theta the parameters of my generative model plus some random fluctuation uh, omega x so that equation is called the state dynamics equation but what it basically is telling you is that the dynamics of the world is driven by x by the position of the world basically and these are all my belief about how the world is changing dx over dt the velocity of the world and technically speaking, F is called the flow of the state dynamics. It's the deterministic part of the state dynamics. Omega X, random fluctuation, is what encodes your uncertainty about your belief about how the world is changing. Yeah? The second equation uh, basically connects to the second concept that I introduced here. It's basically telling you that my belief about my sensation about like what's the most likely um, sensation that i'm going to be receiving is encoded in this equation where my observation is equal to the g of the function of again hidden states the causes new and the parameters some parameters plus some random fluctuation omega y it's called the observation model again Omega Y encodes your uncertainty about your belief about the most likely sensation that you will be experiencing, a sensation that is caused by the world. You, you notice that we have this, these again, your hidden state here, X, and then uh, you, the cause is new. Now, if you're wondering, so you, you know what the thetas are. These are just the parameters of the functional form of F and G. But if you're wondering what causes are, this is something that I'm not going to be focusing in this um, particular talk. But uh, just imagine that if you have a hierarchical generative model, these causes are just a subset of the hidden states. The, these are like the hidden states that do not have dynamics, but they're the tools that different levels in the hierarchy use to be able to talk to each other. So interlayer communication is done using these news or the causes. These are the ones that basically drive the dynamics. You notice that that's why we have x dot equals f of x and new. They, they, drive, they uh, drive the dynamics. Without them, the layers cannot talk to each other, basically. Now, if you want to like turn this into a belief-based system where you have probabilities in play, you, you just need to assume a Gaussian distribution over your random fluctuation, namely with mean, mean zero and some precision uh, over your random variable x and your observation y. Just my, you know, open brackets, precision is just inverse uncertainty um, and close brackets. That's just a notion in statistics. Now, using this, if you literally replace, um, you know, this um, notion of a Gaussian distribution into your original equation, you end up with this probabilistic sort of, um, uh, you know, notion that the probability of x dot given all of these three elements is distributed according to a normal distribution where again the precision is the same as the precision of your random fluctuation but you notice that because we're summing up f with this guy over here you, the, the mean of that gaussian distribution becomes this f term same story for the your belief about your y your, your observations and that is why i'm saying that f of x and nu and theta is the expected your expected um, dynamics about x dot because it's literally the expected value of the Gaussian distribution. Same story here. G of x nu and theta is your expectation about your observation, your sensation. Again, it is the sort of expected value of this Gaussian distribution, the, the value that is most likely to occur. So that's generative model. Two things. We know the dynamics of the world. We have belief, let's say, we don't know it. We have beliefs about the dynamics of the world, and we have belief about uh, basically uh, the most likely sensation that we will be experiencing if such and such was the state of affair of the world. Let's say X was the state of affairs in the world. Now, we talked about inference. Let's talk about Bayes' rule really quickly. Now, here, this is Bayes' rule, and 
that the components of Bayes' rule are as follows. We have the likelihood term, which is the probability of my observation given uh, the state of the world. We have a prior belief, which means that before observing Y, this is my belief about what the world looks like. We have the ev model evidence, which is probability of data. And these two together is called basically the, the generative model. Again, like this is in line with what, what we discussed here. This is basically your prior belief about the dynamics. And this is literally the mapping between X and Y, which is your likelihood term. So I'm not saying anything new here. These two together are your generative model. And this is your model evidence. This is a devil, right? This is intractable. You notice that in a real life scenario, we will not be able to calculate this. And this term on the left-hand side is called a posterior probability. It's your belief about the distribution over hidden state of the world, X. And when you map your generative model using Bayes' rule to uh, this posterior distribution, we call this model inversion, right? So if whenever you hear model inversion in the context of FEP, that's what we mean by that. So this evidence, again, going back to our idea of marginalizing a variable out, if you again just remind yourself that this is how you marginalize the hidden state hit or X out, you just end up with probability of let's say sensation Y. You notice that this integration could get really nasty really fast, which means that if you have you, you could have basically any number of hidden states X, and for each X, you, you would have a range of possible values. So this thing could turn into a potentially like potentially inf infinite number of nested integrals, basically. It can, it can become intractable really, really quickly. So what this means is we will not be able to calculate this posterior probability um, exactly. So what should we do? The answer is variational inference. So because uh, you, you see probability of data, your model evidence is intractable, but at the same time, ironically, it's the, the true measure of how good your generative model is, um, which means that th th we call this also marginal likelihood, right? So if it is high, it means whatever sensation you're experiencing right now under your model of the world, under your generative model of the world, the probability of that particular sensation is very high. It means under your model of the world, everything that you're sensing, you already expect it to, to sense it. So it means you have such a strong and uh, you know and a precise belief and pr precise yeah belief about the dynamics of the world and how the sensations are generated from those uh, those dynamics that whatever you're receiving is not surprising. That that's why model evidence is such a strong. A metric for evaluating how good a generative model is, but unfortunately, it's intractable. So, can we find a bound to this, namely a lower bound? And the answer is yes. I'm going to introduce the idea of an evidence lower bound in the next slide. So, by doing this, I'm turning the problem on its head. So, I'm turning, uh, converting, let's say, a, an intractable exact calculation of the posterior. And I'm replacing that with a tractable approximation, um, well, basically a tractable approximate estimation of the posterior. And that's called variational inference. And uh, I'll tell you what, why we call this variational, by the way, because the objective function that we're going to be minimizing to do that is variational free energy is actually a function of a function. It's a functional. So wherever, we, wherever you're dealing with functionals and optimizing functionals, uh, that's where the calculus of variation comes into play. That's what, what it means by variational inference. Now, on the right-hand side, I'm just going to put some reminders, the expected value and the, this particular uh, particular law of logarithms, and in the middle, this is called Jensen's inequality. Just keep keep um, uh, keep an eye on this one. It just says that the expected value of a log of something is always a lower bound to the log of the expected value of that thing, right? So this is going to come in handy. So let's study these, uh, this uh, amazing concept of evidence lower bound. Remember, P of Y is intractable. We want to find the bound to it. So this is log of probability of data. Um, this is how we marginalize X out. 
and you can multiply and divide by this by, by, by something right whatever it is so here qx is we call this surrogate the surrogate posterior over the hidden state this is going to be a representative or your approximation to the true unknown posterior belief right so let's call it qx and it's by the way it's really a key factor in variational inference and fep so keep that in mind this q um, um, variable this q function so moving on you you do a little bit of play here so this this sort of q moves to the denominator and you notice that this is the definition of expectation with respect to this particular distribution q right just uh, getting the definition from uh, from here and according to jensen's inequality um this term has a lower bound and this is the lower bound to it so the expected of uh, of this term the expected value of this term over this probability distribution you have the joint here and you have the surrogate distribution here and you see so this right hand side again remind yourself this is your log model evidence and we found the lower bound to it using jensen's inequality right so the lower bound is found this guy is your evidence lower bound um and that that's a key finding that by maximizing this evidence lower band you're actually maximizing uh your mo your log model evidence and you're getting closer and closer to the true posterior now elbow and vfe just want to make sure that we're clear on this we have elbow here um but vfe or variational inference is just negative of your elbow so if you multiply neg minus one by both sides of this you end up with this term always bigger than minus log probability of data this is called surprisal and this is called variational free energy that's why we say vfe is always an upper bound to surprise so maximizing elbow or minimizing vfe they they both mean the same thing and um this is basically called variational free energy and that's why we call it a functional because this thing is a function of a of another function and this is called surprisal or surprise and just shows you in a plot that here you've got variational free energy that's always an upper bound to the true unknown surprisal or by extension you've got your elbow here that's always a lower bound to the true um, log model evidence so vfe has multiple incarnations it comes in different forms by playing with the math so if this is your this is your vfe just expand you can just expand the joint and the denominator and then literally use the log rule of the you know uh, the division turned into the subtraction and then you can distribute the expectation across the two different terms and this um this basically results into like just basically swapping these two terms uh, by each other you end up with this equation right and these terms have names so this one actually this expected value between your belief about the, the hidden state and the true unknown posterior this expectation is called a, 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 a kl divergence it measures how different your belief about x qx is from the true unknown posterior that's why it's called an approximate error approximation error and the second term is your surprise right um so um if i want to like show you like what this actually means visually this is really interesting so this is your surprisal right and on top of surpriser you're adding this approximation error this is this uh, sort of length over here and then this constitutes your free energy what this means is like free energy is always an upper bound on surprisal and the error the, that gap is your approximation error is how far your belief about x is from the true posterior so by tuning your generative model your variational free energy goes down and when it goes down this gap is reducing so it, which means that your q gets closer and closer to the true posterior which means a better and better perception about the world and this doesn't end here your free energy will get closer and closer to the surprisal um basically by extension to the model evidence which is the metric that we're going to be used using for you know comparing different models with one another a second incarnation of vfe is again we're going to expand the denominator 
again into this joint. So previously was P of X given Y times probability of Y. Now we go probability of Y given X times P of X. And again, distributing um, the log, and then we distribute the uh, you know the expectation, and then just uh, you know uh, swapping the terms. Again, you have this KL divergence over here, and you have this negative this uh, negative expectation. Now, this thing over here is called accuracy. It means how accurate am I under my belief of the world? The expect the expected value of observing y under my estimation of where the world is x so the higher this is it means the more accurate your belief about the world is that is that is basically causing your observations but at the same time this term over here is called complexity it means that if you have some prior belief about the world you you will not be able to just move your cue wherever you want it is it has to stay close to your prior belief over here so this is basically a regularizer if you will um, and the third incarnation is um, basically, again, here, this is the definition of VFE, again, you know, the log rule. Um, so we end up with these two terms. So this guy over here is called expected, sorry, it's called expected internal energy. And this guy is your entropy. So that's the expected value of uh, log of QX. We call this entropy. Um how do we minimize variational free energy? We have to maximize our entropy and we have to maximize our internal energy. Now, this term makes sense that we need to maximize it, but what does this one mean? It means that your Q will stay as smooth as possible, as simple as possible. This connects really well with Occam's razor if you're from machine learning background, uh, that your be the best model is the one that provides the most accurate account of the data but at the same time, the simplest explanation for that data. This simplicity is enforced by this entropy term. It, it states smooth. So this is very interesting. So these were just three incarnations of variational free energy. And the goal of inverting the generative model is basically uh, we, uh, the, the GM strives to minimize this VFE. Um, this achieves two things. I hinted this uh, just a little bit previously, but... It means that the actual uh, value of VFE will approach the intractable minus log probability of data. This is going to be used for model comparison. And the surrogate distribution will approach the unknown posterior belief. Remember, that was the goal of um, you know, perception in the first place. And once you reach that, basically minimize your variational free energy, you can use the actual value of free energy as the metric, as a proxy for the unknown model evidence to compare different generative models together, right? So the model with the lowest variational free energy is going to be the best model. Yeah, I think I've explained that one. Now, just to let you know that the true form of the posterior is unknown, and you see that the, the terms like the, the probability distribution, the joint distribution here, um, is, is not guaranteed that um, you know they're analytically simple, uh, you know, to to derive and and you know work with. Because of that, um, there is this idea that we can actually use Laplace approximation to break down each one of the distributions and basically approximate them using a Taylor expansion. Um, particularly up to the third term, which means that I'm providing a quadratic approximation using Taylor expansion for each one of the components um, within variational free energy. Um, unfortunately, I, do, I don't have the time to go over the detailed derivation, but m suffice it to say that the result of you know, S approximating all the components is that the variational free energy simplifies to this equation. For those of you who are interested at uh, to know the details, I encourage you to look at the a primer on variational Laplace paper, which is a, an amazing paper. Um, it, it goes through all the details of derivation. So basically, free energy um, reduces to log of the joint distribution, and you have the posterior um, covariance, and then yeah, n is basically the number of parameters and the states that you have, and so on and so forth. Now. Predictive coding, this uh, this is basically where it gets even more interesting. It is uh, basically a hierarchical generative model that we're going to be using to model human perception. And the goal is to invert this hierarchical model. 
So it's a powerful framework to describe how the cortex accumulates evidence from noisiest stimuli. Um, it's an application of the free energy principle. It focuses on how uh, this literally fantastic organ can perform probabilistic inference about the most likely hidden cause that has caused the sensory signal. Um, it assumes that the brain has a generative model of the world through which it constantly infers the hidden states of the world, and it can also learn the parameters while inferring the hidden state of the world. So model inversion happens by minimizing variational free energy. Again, even though it's hierarchical, but the concept is, stays the same. So in predictive coding, we have this concept of top-down predictions, where predictions go from inside out about the, your sensations, right? And then the prediction error is calculated, like what I described before. And then this, these errors, if I want to be more precise, the precision-weighted prediction errors are sent back from outside in, uh, or they call it bottom-up uh, sort of direction, so that uh, the, the estimations of the world, the estimation of the posterior beliefs about the world are corrected, basically. That's what uh, model inversion, that's when model inversion happens, when the posterior estimates get adjusted. And it looks like something like this. We have this hierarchical model that we have the same story of state dynamics and observation model, but here we have this happening at each level, and then you notice that these news, these causes, are the ones that link layer I to I minus one. That's the important part, that the, the, without these news, without these causes, the layers cannot talk to each other. You notice that it is a hierarchical dynamical system, uh, basically. Um, now, how do we design an experiment um, for, you know, for, for, for this kind of perception, neuromimetic modeling using the free energy principle. I just want to give you the sort of ingredients here. You, the designer, you first have to define your generative process. That's X. That's the true uh, hidden states. I should have maybe said X star. Yeah, X star would have been a better notion. Then you will generate the observations. This is some sort of some transformation of the X's. You can add noise to it. You can transform it the way you want. But that's going to be the observations that's going to hit the Markov blanket. This, these are what this. Uh, the, the, this is basically where the sensory state observes and receives those sensations. You have to define your generative model. This part, this part is the tricky part, right? The Fs and Gs in your dynamical system, that's where uh, everything gets really tricky. How would you define them? If it's hierarchical, how many layers should it have, basically? These are the big questions. You have to define the evaluation metric, that how would you define different generative models um, with each other? And then you, uh, you have to design the online state inference loop. Now, this is, by the way, just... For this case, for this presentation, it's just about state inference. And then you have to compare different generative models. This is where Bayesian model comparison comes into play. Now, here, um, you basically use a dynamical system. Here, I'm just using a lotka volterra process that you know, captures the dynamics between uh, the hunter and, and, and the prey together. It's a two-dimensional sort of world if you will. So by solving the trajectories, by solving the differential equations, you get to this sort of trajectory. So you have 1,000 data points here, each of which is two-dimensional. So this is the unknown states of the world, right? This is the di unknown dynamics of the world regenerative process. Again, it's unknown. It's beyond the Markov blanket. Again, so this is the figure that we saw before. Now you can assume that you've got the brain here and you've got a uh, degenerative process, X star on the left-hand side. The observations Y are basically a noisy version of the same uh, hidden state. So you notice that this is, this is really noisy here, right? So the brain has to receive that and then infer the true states here, right? So for a one-layer predictive coding network for these particular experiments, you have just sim a simple sort of generative model. So it's just one layer. And then uh, I'm sort of comparing two generative models here where the flow of the, st of the state dynamics are different. On the left-hand side, you have something that we call just, it's just, it's just a pullback attractor. Uh, we have this two-by-two two matrix here, and we have this sort of point of attraction, which assumes that everything collapses into this world. Just... Just to be clear, it means that my generative model of the world assumes that the world beyond the Markov blanket is attracted to a particular center called psi, 
right? That's what I mean by believing something about the world. Whereas the second flow, the second generative model, is a sinusoidal sort of belief. It means that I believe there is something periodic about the world beyond my Markov blanket. And the Gs, I, I just kept them as identity, which means that whatever new is, is going to be my prediction about my sensation, right? So I kept the Gs identical. Now, the evaluation metric, this is very important. As the inference is happening online, for every observation, you have to make an inference um, and then predict the sensation and then calculate the prediction error and then eventually calculate your variational free energy. Because it's happening online, you can actually literally accumulate your free energy, variational free energy across the entire inference period. So at the end, you will end up with one scalar value. It's called the time integral of, uh, of your variational free energy. They call it free action, right? It's just a fancy way of summing up variational free energy across the entire inference, inference period. In, basically, it's time integral. And it is, interestingly, it's an upper bound to the accumulated surprise. So variational free energy is an upper bound to surprise, and um, free action is an, is an upper bound to the accumulated surprise, because free action is, in and out of itself, an accumulation of variational free energy. And this is, you have to also then define the online state inference loop. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but um, basically for each observation, you will make predictions and you calculate the prediction errors. You calculate your free energy. You calculate the gradient of free energy with respect to your estimations of the posterior. That's the key part. And then this is where you have to update your beliefs about the world. And it's, you, notice, you notice that it's a differential equation because the way you're going to update your, um, your belief about the world, it's continuous. It, it, it happens in continuous time. It means between each two observations, yi and yi plus one, I have to integrate over this update rule to move from my previous belief about the world, mu x, to a new mu x at the next time step. And that's why the integration happens here. And just so you know, this equation is basically saying that the amount by which I'm going to change my belief about the world mu x is, first of all, the gradient of free energy with respect to mu x, right? That's typical gradient descent. But the second term, it serves as a momentum. It means that if I'm going to update my belief about where the world is, I'm going to consider the velocity of the world as well, right? If I'm going to estimate the velocity of the world, I'm going to consider the acceleration of the world as well. It's, it's similar to the idea of momentum in optimization algorithms. This is the bit that helps you, uh, you know, catch up with the chasing target that is the world that I talked about in the beginning. And then by, you integrate this differential equation to update your belief about the world. And then the next observation happens. So this continues for all the observations and you're accumulating your free energy as time goes by. And the result will be your, your free action. So the result is this. So this is the first generative model with the pullback attractor. Um, so this is the uh, inferred state, right? And this is, the, this is interesting. This is the accumulated free action, right? Um, very, very interesting. You notice that uh, free action um, is having these regular jumps. It means periodically I'm getting surprised about my sensations. Remember that if you note here, the, this is where these nonlinearities happen. It means that my simple pullback attractor fails to capture those dynamics. So it gets surprised. But interestingly, where things are linear and simple, I'm not getting much surprise. So it's almost constant here. So, the, so uh, I'm good at capturing simple dynamics, but not highly, not the ones that are highly nonlinear. Whereas the sinusoidal one, you notice that we are capturing the magnitudes much better. We have a steady increase in free action. We don't get surprise for some dynamics and less surprise for other dynamics. We are always equally surprised for everything, which is interesting that like, here, we are getting surprised consistently for everything, but here we are not getting much surprise for these particular dynamics. So one is good, cap uh, good in capturing nonlinear dynamics, periodic dynamics. The other one is better in capturing simpler linear dynamics, which is interesting. And notice that the reaction here is much lower than the free action here. So basically, this means that this model is much better. Now, looking at the, gen the generative power of these uh, GMs. 
So this is the G function, if you remember, G of X and mu. That's the prediction of your one-layer predictive coding network about the sensation. That's the bit that gets compared with the true sensation and the prediction error is calculated. Remember that observations, just like hidden states, are two-dimensional. So this is the first dimension of Y, the true sensation, and Y had the predicted sensation. You notice that they're almost close, and also with a second um, dimension, they, it's not doing a bad job, right? But for the second generative model, again, it's doing a much better job in capturing the magnitudes of the, of, of the system. Again, you notice that it's not so good in generating these bits, whereas the, the first model is better in generating prediction, more accurate predictions of the, of the first type. Now, these are the results, the pullback attractor and trigonometric, the sinusoidal um, sort of flow. You notice that the free action of the second model is lower, it's better. And MSE loss, which basically compar uh, compares the estimated X and the true X, the inferred X and true X together is also slightly lower. So free action shows that the second model is good. And this is where Bayesian model comparison uh, comes into play, where we use base factor for comparison. It basically says that we take the, uh, the model evidence for each one of the models and we divide them. Now, because these are intractable, we are using free action as a proxy. And when you put the values of free action, you get to this value. Because it's higher than one, it basically means that you have to pick the second model because it has a lower free action. It doesn't get as surprised as the first one. And at some point of caution, free action versus MSE. MSE, as a measure of accuracy, should never, and I repeat, never be consulted on its own because it ignores complexity. So, for example, what if the free action of Model 1 and Model 2, uh, the Model 1 had a lower free action, but what if the MSE of the first model was actually higher than, M than the second model? Which one would you choose? Again, you have to choose Model 1 because... This has higher power of generalizability to the unseen data. So it has less chances of overfitting to the, to the data. We call that free action, again, as complexity minus accuracy. So what if we remove complexity? Again, we will overfit. But that was important. Some final thoughts. You can definitely learn the parameters and also estimate uncertainty about the world. So these are the things that are not covered in this presentation, but you can do that. This is where the separation of time scales um, will come into play. The DEM algorithm does exactly that. This is dynamic expectation maximization. I encourage you guys to take a look at that algorithm. It's you, using that you can solve the triple estimation problem. Now, can I go beyond X dot? Yes, you can. That's where you jump into the world of the generalized coordinates of motion where you're not only using x, estimating x dot, but you're also estimating higher temporal derivatives of, uh, of the world, you have a, a, a system of coupled differential equations rather than having just two equations, which is very, very interesting, actually. Um, also, remember that active inference is not the same as predictive coding. Um, uh, Particularly in the philosophy, um, you know, um, communities, I've heard that people use active inference when they're talking about predictive coding. Remember that in predictive coding, we are simply doing um, making sense of the world. There is no concept of planning or action in play. Um, the ML community, unfortunately, um, does not work with the dynamics of the world, and AI uh, um, basically is going to the opposite direction instead of. Uh, using smart data, we are just going bigger and bigger data. So we would like a world that ChatGPT would also ask you a question and becomes curious about you to receive information that it selects, basically. So where should you start with, uh, with the free energy principle? These are the resources that I strongly recommend you, some videos on YouTube. Hopefully, you can later on pause this video and go through these links, some papers that I'm recommending here, and the last one, the two books that I believe, the red one, the predictive mind is for philosophy community, and the first one goes through the math extensively. It's a beautiful uh, book. Yeah, the, uh, And the videos, I, I, I recommend that you guys start with the videos in the first place. And I would like to just acknowledge our funding from the Mercury.
and also uh, my colleagues uh, Simon Urbas and Professor Fristen, and also acknowledge uh, the folks at UCL, UC UCD, and Monash University who have always supported uh, uh, our work. And here's the link to the the code that everybody can just take a look and run. The README file is self-explanatory. Unfortunately, I ran out of time and I won't be able to show a demo. But yeah, that's it. So thank you, Maron. Thank you. That was great. And, and uh, we have 10 minutes. If you want to show anything, or I can okay, ask perfect. some questions, but but we have till five minutes after, if you want to show anything, or even just okay, sc so scanning the repo could be cool. Okay, sure, sure, sure. That's great. Thank you for that. But just um, wanted to comment yeah, so your your educational materials and the YouTube channel are great. And and they are they're an excellent supplement to the textbook and to the math learning. I appreciate that. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I also have a YouTube channel, ML Don. Feel free to take a look. I'm actually reading the active inference book on that channel. So hopefully it would be of interest to you guys. And this is the repository that is publicly available. Um, the readme file is pretty self-explanatory. And this is just a one-layer predictive coding network for the task of inference and modeling human perception as a task of inference. These are the same plots that you've seen. Um, so basically, all the functions are here, right? Everything you need is here. So the main function is the one that you're going to be dealing with. And this YAML file is where you actually choose the parameters uh, of your experiment. Just to show you in action what it looks like. So if you actually clone this repository on your machine, you just have to go to the YAML file and just do a, re a quick scan of the README file. But basically... Uh, using th this is where you define your generative process. For example, you can say, I want it to be a Lotka Volterra process. And this is how I'm going to be picking the DT and the total time uh, to actually solve the trajectories of my generative process. You can define your generative model here. You can define the dynamics to be like a pullback attractor or a trigonometric one. The likelihood, for example, is identity here. These are the dimensions of your X and Y two and one, you might wonder why it's two for X is because you have X and X dot together, where the world is and how fast the world is changing. And this is just Y in your uh, generative model. You can increase them. Uh, that's where you jump into the world of generalized coordinates of motion, but this is beyond the scope of my talk today. Again, this, the, these bits are beyond the, the scope of our talk today. This is where uh, you basically talk about the correlation between the noise process across different levels of the generalized coordinates. So the noise on the velocity, how does it correlate with the noise process on the acceleration, your belief about the acceleration of the world? So how do they interact with one another? That's where these um, values come into play. And then this is the kind of noise that you will use to alter the true states of the world and generate your observations. For example, you can use a colored noise here. You define the mean and uh, basically the standard deviation of noise. And this is, we're using the sort of kernel here uh, that convolves with the white noise to actually generate a more smooth noise. The reason being that this, um, the biological systems belie are believed to be uh, working with, uh, you know, to, to, to all, the, all the signals that you work with in biological and organic systems are believed to have been generated by some sort of dynamics. That's why we keep them as smooth noises, infinitely differentiable noises rather than just white noise. And uh, if you actually run this, so this is basically a pullback attractor. This is the first uh, sort of generative model that you worked in. So you just run this main function. <clears throat> so we have 1,000 observations, noisy observations, right? And immediately this happens. So for every 10 observations, we are accumulating free action. You notice that free action is ever increasing because it just accumulates free energy. And on the right-hand side, you have VFE or variational free energy. Um, again, if you look at the definitions inside uh, the functions folder of how we calculate or compute the variational free energy, you notice that um, it's a far more simpl simplified version of what you would see about free energy is because everything is under Laplace approximation and you end up with far more simpler terms. And the final result is 
reaction is this much and basically uh, your final MSE loss is 0.53. And if you want to see the final output, you just have to go into the results folder. And these are the folders that are generated, just so that you have two dimensions in X, one dimension in Y. Lotka Volterra is a generative process. For example, the generative model follows a pullback attractor scheme, and then you, your G is just identity. This is your free action, and then that is your MSE loss. And if you open it, all the plots that I showed you in the presentation are saved as PDF here, just to give you an idea. Like, this is your X, this is your true invisible uh, states of the world, right? And if you want to look at X hat, this is the inferred states of the world. And these are, for example, the, the noisy observations of the world. Yeah. So I hope that the repository would be um, of help and of interest to all of you. Thank you very much. Great. What kinds of problems or settings do you feel that this could be adapted to or useful for? Um, I would say, uh, f first foremost, this could be used for, um, uh, basically, it's it's all about any kind of problem that's about inference. You have some noisy observations that you want to infer the hidden state, but in terms of adaptability, you can build on that by introducing parameter learning as well as uncertainty estimation. So our goal is to develop this into a triple estimation sort of package predictive coding network and add more layers to it so to have a hierarchical predictive coding uh, capable of solving the triple estimation problem yeah that's the ultimate thing that you can actually adapt this to cool um what are your uh what are you excited about for ML Dawn or for your learning or research in next year? Um, I'm very much excited in embedding these kinds of calculations into the world of AI, because as I said, AI is moving, in my opinion, and my humble opinion is moving to the towards a wrong direction. And instead of bombarding models with all sorts of data, the, the model should be able to choose its data. So I'm very excited in you know, developing this framework into a hierarchical predictive coding network and then sort of compare the performance of such a model with other traditional AI-based generative models and basically show its superiority um, that I believe it has in different scenarios. And ultimately, this model is going to be used for, uh, in my grant proposal, and a project I'm working on, it's going to be used for modeling hallucinations as a kind of false inference about the world. Um, and it's going to be used as a proxy to, for us to understand what happens in uh, neuropsychiatric disorders when people actually suffer from hallucinations in the brain. So this predictive coding network is going to be a brain-inspired AI model for us to understand what goes wrong in, in the skull of a human being when they suffer from hallucinations about the world. So that's what I'm really, really excited about and really hoping to achieve. Cool. It's like inspired by the brain, for the brain. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Maron. Great, great presentation and good luck with the continuation of the work. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Okay. Till next time.